Well, welcome back to The Biggest Little Adventures. My name's Carlo. We're just going to start off this year with an adventure story. It's uh, towards the end of January. I haven't produced a lot because I had a death in the family and that sort of set me back. I didn't really feel like doing too much video. So to get things back in, you know, production, I thought I'd tell a story about one of my adventures. So years ago, uh, a girlfriend of mine, she wanted to go to South Africa to uh, volunteer with, with chimpanzees. And so we're setting it up. We had to pay money to, to volunteer for room and board, I guess. And then a couple of weeks before we we're going to go, there is this uh, article in the newspaper where a chimpanzee had torn this lady's face off. Um, I don't know if it was the owner or like a friend visiting or whatever. And, and I was like, we're not dealing with wild chimps. They're tear a face off. And so being the protective boyfriend that I was, I decided I'll look into it. And we found these little tiny monkeys that also needed saving, so to speak. Uh, and they're about the size of a cat. I don't remember what type of monkeys they, they were called. I just remember they ha the males had these bright blue balls uh, and they would sit there and stare at you and touch themselves. It was a little disconcerting. But in the pamphlet, the you know they show you know the volunteers feeding little baby little baby uh almost like I said chipmunks monkeys you know and doing all this kind of stuff but in reality uh it was a working party for you military folks you know what that means um for those non-military folks out there slave labor that's the translation so um so we get there and you know we get to south africa we check in take a few days we go to this reserve that uh had been rescuing these monkeys and basically these monkeys they eat like rotten fruit um and they actually help out but the farmers think they're eating their their good fruit so they try to shoot them and stuff like that so some would get injured and can't survive in the wild and they go to this reserve. So even though they're actually beneficial because they eat the rotten fruit, which keeps the, uh, all of this I learned, I didn't know this before, uh, the, the insect population down, which prevents other fruit from going bad and all this kind of stuff. So anyways, we're, we get there, we check in, we have this little cabin, so to speak, with uh, no running water, no heat, no air conditioning. And it does have one electrical switch um, and one light bulb. The uh, toilets and the showers are a walk down the block. So this is where we we're going to be for the next three weeks, spending like $1,500. So we meet, we meet the folks who are running it and good enough people if you like cult leaders. So basically, you know, they're talking about how they're buying all this land and basically they have college students working for college credits. Well, we weren't college students. We, well, we had one do-gooder and then me making sure she wasn't kidnapped in South Africa um, along for the ride. So um, they're explaining how they're vegetarian and, you know, saving the earth, all this kind of stuff. And uh, I soon found out that vegetarian means to them uh, feeding their workers for cheap. No meat, hardly any vegetables, uh, mostly white bread, rice, pasta, and beer. Uh, but the beer you had to buy yourself extra. So everyone took turns doing chores and stuff like that. So you had these 16, 17 year old high school and college kids that have never cooked anything but ramen, cooking ramen for everybody. Um, so <clears throat> I was thinking, oh, I'll lose a few pounds eating vegetarian. The vegetable was missing from this, from this place, but I digress. So we're at this place and we quickly learn that you have to be like a long-term volunteer to, to go into the cage with the, with the little baby monkeys. Um, and so, I found myself digging fire breaks. And for those of you who don't know what a fire break is, 
is you basically dig up all the vegetation, uh, usually for a 20 or more yards. Um, so if a fire comes, it, there's no fuel, so it doesn't jump into the enclosures. Uh, they wanted me to build 10 feet wide fire breaks which I said is useless and it's just a waste of time because it's not wide enough. And they said, well, we can't get the students to dig any wider than that. So I said upon my first day for Marine, they want me to dig, dig, good at that, plenty of experience, so I dug. So I ended up digging like uh, a 200 yard by um, 10 feet long fire brick around this enclosure, enclosure and they, we're like, how did you dig so fast? I'm like, because I just moved the shovel type deal, you know? Like, it's it's digging. It's not really complicated. And they're like, oh, you've done more work than months of the other students. I'm like, well, probably because they're lazy or they feel like they're paying, so they shouldn't have to do slave labor. By the way, I'm drinking a little Bundaberg rum and Coke. Bundaberg, uh, great Australian rum. Bundy and rum, they call it. So anyways, um, and then in our, to take a break, we would chop up, I don't know, uh, 500 to 1,000 uh, plates of bowls of vegetables. That the, the monkeys got vegetables, just not the humans. And fruit and like, you know, you would try to sneak in some nutrition when they're not looking and eating this uh, monkey vegetables and stuff like that. So we're preparing that. And then you're carting it around. And so basically this is the next three weeks. Drinking with uh, 18 year olds, eating crappy ramen pasta with no vegetables, digging fire breaks and uh, chopping up food for monkeys that are eating better than, than the humans. So I'm sort of getting tired of this, but it's her thing and it's sort of like mindless for me. So I just put on a little music back then. We had iPods, um, which is an iPhone that doesn't have the phone part for you younger folks. So anyways, my girlfriend, we'll call her Mari uh, to protect her identity because some uh, of my former lovers don't like to be associated with my hijinks. So we'll call her Mari. I'm not saying that's her real name, but it is. So uh, she uh, she's like, this sucks. I'm like, yes, I told you that like day two. Um, and oh, by the way, we don't have like vacation. The, they said like once you work like two and a half weeks, you get a day in town or something like that. So I mean, and you're paying for this and this is on my vacation time. Um, so anyways, so we're going, she's like, I wanna go, I'm like, let's do it. So we get a ride into town, um, with like people that actually are authorized to go and we just go and, uh, we go to like an Avis and I rent a car or I try to rent a car. So Avis, same company as here in the United States, but it took about 30 minutes to decide on a car because of some, uh, language barrier between South African English and American English. That squeaking noise is my dog chewing ironically on a stuffed monkey. So anyways, so they're, they're like, hey, do you want a car with the, well, they have South African, Africana, right? Do you want the car with the boot? And I'm like, a what? And they're like, a boot. And I'm like, I have no idea what you're saying. They're like, a boot. And I'm like, are you saying boot? And they're like, yes, a boot. And I'm like, I, I have no idea what that means. Like, do I want cars that come with shoes? And they're like, no, a boot. And so they draw me a picture of a boot, not a car that they're trying to describe, but an actual boot. I'm like, I know what a boot is. I got, I got boots on, you know, what, how does that apply to a car? So there's a little frustration because we both speak English, but apparently not the same type. So she goes out she shows me a normal car, a, a coupe. And she's like the boot. That's when I realized a boot means trunk. So basically a car with a boot because it has sort of like the boot shape because it has a trunk, a boot sticks out the back. That's how, what they mean? Uh, a hatchback, I guess is just called a car or maybe it's called a purse. I don't know, but coops, boots. So anyways, I'll take a boot. That way we could lock stuff in the trunk where, you know, 
all the honest people of South Africa don't steal it from us. So we get this car and we're driving back to the uh, enclosure. And um, I'm like, well, how, how are we going to tell them? And she's like, who cares? We already paid them. We're not going to be staying there. It's not like we're costing them mon the money. We're actually leaving, you know, like a week and they could just keep, keep the money for the room, room and board, room and board. So I'm like, all right, well, we should have like something to tell them. Well, her aunt had just died shortly before we went on this trip. And I'm like, well, let's just tell them your aunt died and we have to fly back to the United States because I didn't want to lie. And both of those statements were true, just not chronologically relevant at the time because eventually we were going to fly back to the United States, right? So she's like, okay. So I'm like, well, you go tell them. I'll start packing up, loading up the car. So we're trying to like get out before anyone notices us, so to speak, right? Just disappear. Um, and so they heard, I don't know, through the grapevine, uh, the blue bulb monkeys must have passed some Morse code or something. And uh, that we were leaving. So they come down to the hooch. And of course, I'm the only one there. And I do not want to lie about this whole thing. So like, what's going on? So I'm figuring, just don't say anything, right? And I'm like, oh, you know, we have to go. And they're like, why? And I'm like, oh, well, there's a death in their family. Her aunt died. This was her aunt's name. You know, she lived down here. And I just started spilling all true things just out of, once again, chronological order. And so Mari walks up and sees me just like overwhelmed with this big chronological lie. And uh, she's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I don't know. I just got caught off guard type deal. So she's like, we're going, blah, blah, blah. Thanks for all the, the ramen, you know, and fire breaks. We're going to go. So we leave. And so we're driving around. So now we have like 15 days left in uh, South Africa before we have to fly out. And <laughs> that's another story, the flight out. But anyways, um, we start asking around and they're like, hey, go to Kruger National Park. So we're like, okay, what's that? They don't describe it well. They're like, oh, it's a wildlife reserve where animals aren't poached. We're like, okay. So Kruger would not exist in the United States because of one agency called OSHA. Uh, basically, it's hundreds of maybe thousands of square miles. I mean, it's like larger than some U.S. states. It starts in South Africa and I think goes up to Kenya or something like that. And it's sort of fenced off wildlife reserve like a what we would call a national park where there's no hunting of poaching of animals and stuff like that well i mean there probably is but it's illegal so um so the animals could sort of um live you know in their natural environment and so you're there's no building on there it's a wildlife reserve so we go up to kruger you sort of pay a little bit to get in and the deal is is that you're not allowed to get out, out of your car except for an, a few certain spots like overlooks and stuff but for the most part you can't get out of your car because animals will eat you no shit and uh and so you go in and the deal is is there's these little camps that have you know 20 foot high walls with electric fence around them and they're open during the day and then right before sunset they close them and they close the entrance and exits to the park so if you were not inside of one of these little base camps or out of the park, you're sleeping in your car because you can't get out and they shut, they shut them. Like you can't just pound on the door and they're going to open it because I don't know, maybe bandits, but mostly like lions and tigers and elephants and all that kind of stuff. So, I mean, and they have huge, huge sort of like swinging doors, like a castle. So we're driving around and they have, you get a map of where they are. They're about every 200 kilometers, 100 50 miles apart or something like that. So you sort of plan your day driving around and start at one, you go to another type deal. And they're all sort of the same. They have the same like cafe restaurant and the same sort of uh, buffet restaurant and then a nice like fine dining restaurant and then a little like sort of seven day store in there. And then they have some like 
thatch mud circular huts with the thatch roof and then they have some uh basically motels and then you know like the higher end cabins so uh, and then they have spots for you to camp in the tent because uh, theoretically it's walled and electrified so you won't get attacked by anything, theoretically. So we're going on ground all the time and Africa has the Big Five, okay? I know we have a sporting goods store called Big Five, but they have, the, maybe it's related. Just thought of that, just dawned. It was like I, I was 35 before I realized that Scooby never talked, that Shaggy was just high, and he never interacted with anybody but Shaggy. Go back and look. So anyways, uh, Big Five is uh, the lions, leopards, um, which are solo hunters, I learned. Water buffalo, don't mess with them. Uh, hippopotamus and elephants. Those are the Big Five. And so, you know, everyone's like, oh, you'll see... Maybe rhinoceros is in there somewhere. Anyways, uh, you'll see all of them except for the leopard. We met this one nice couple and they're like, we've been coming here for our anniversary for like 21 years and we've never seen a leopard. So don't worry, but you'll see the rest of them. We're like, okay, maybe hippo's not on the big five. Maybe it's rhinoceros or vice versa, but hippos kill more than any other animal. Anyways, I feel the Bundy kicking in. So... Uh, we're driving around and I mean herds of zebra are, are, are running just to, they're just dirt roads basically and we're everyone's in like in these souped up like uh, land cruisers and all this kind of stuff and we're basically in the equivalent of a Ford Escort with a boot uh, a coupe and uh, I don't, some other company made it had a line on it Peugeot or something like that who knows but uh so we're driving around, bottoming out this Ford Escort with full insurance in case that elephant tips it over or anything like that. And everyone's like staring at these stupid Americans in like a Ford Escort, right? And they're all in these souped up vehicles. But the roads are fairly decent. They're not like four wheel drive roads. They're just unpaved. And, uh, and you know, like flocks of, I don't know, herds, I guess is probably, of, of zebra are going by. They call them zebra because they pronounce their Z's wrong. Uh, and you have like giraffes going by and tons of things I will all lump as deer. There's like 45 types of deer, springbok and all these, they're all deer, antelope deer. Probably saw like 50 different species of deer out there. Um, you know, cause you have to have something for the lions to eat. You know, lions and the lions, they don't give a crap. They'll, they walk down the road, block traffic and stuff like that because there's less, you know, impediments because it's a road than like walking through the brush. So they'll walk and block traffic and stuff. And they are, you know, definitely the king of the jungle. There's hyenas and, and it goes through a lot of different uh, tropospheres. So there's different, you know, there's the tundra and there's more of like a, a rainforest type deal. And like, so the, uh, the topography changes and the different animals that live in each type of climate change with that. So, you know, um, there'll be more water buffalo in one certain area and et cetera, et cetera. The thing you could never, none of the roads got close to was all the hippopotamus. I don't know if it's hippopi, but hippopotamus, like rivers and ponds and stuff, because they kill people. Um, it's not the cute jungle book stuff. And so, um, mostly I was taking pictures of hippopotamuses with like a pair of binoculars and a little point and shoot camera in front and made a telephoto lens. And that actually turned out pretty good. I was pretty proud of myself, but you know, and, and there'd be herds of elephant coming by and they said, as long as they don't flap their, their, you know, ears out at you, you'll be fine. Cause that's their like, sort of like, Hey, get the, get the fuck back type deal. And, uh, there was a couple of them we got too close and they started charging and I had to go in reverse so our car didn't get flipped over. Um, so you learn, you know, keep your distance from certain types of animals pretty quick. So anyways, we're going through and um, it was great. A lot of pictures and we're staying in uh, one of the, the walled castles with electrified fence. It's probably like our fourth or fifth night there. We had pretty much seen everything but the leopards and uh, 
and we had eaten at the same restaurants and the, no matter which one you went to it's all the same menu so we're like hey let's go to the little mini mart so to speak and get some uh charcoal which is basically wood they cook on wood so get some wood and some steaks of some type of deer who knows what type but it was deer and uh you know and some uh vegetables and and we'll do a little barbecue and we had rented one of the little round um with thatch roof mud huts and it was actually pretty nice inside they had running water unlike our volunteer um area and so um cooking on the fire pit and i'm getting these you know basically firewood and then you bring it down, down to charcoal so you got it's a little longer process than just cooking straight with coals so i'm getting that going and the biggest skunk i've ever seen in my life comes over to a garbage a metal garbage can down the and just pushes it over and starts digging in it and i'm like what the hell you know my garbage can i don't want to have to clean up the mess and so you know i make some noise and, and it sort of runs off and uh and i was like man that's a big skunk uh it was probably i don't know can you see my hands a little bit longer maybe three to four feet from head to butt and then plus its tail so pretty big skunk um so i'm telling mari about it and she's like oh skunks don't get that big i'm like no seriously this is like a mutant african skunk and so i'm still cooking and i'm you know chopping up stuff getting getting dinner prepared and uh the skunk comes back and same thing just goes straight up to the garbage can pushes over starts rooting around and i'm like look you know and she's like comes out and i'm like hey you know let's get a picture of it so i chase around the skunk and then other people see the skunk in this little campground and so we corner it down this alley and uh i mean i'm trying to take some pictures they didn't flash wasn't working but you know taking pictures i'm thinking as long as it doesn't turn his butt towards me i'm okay because it's a skunk right i mean it's not like they you hear about a lot of skunk attacks but uh so i'm thinking okay and then we corner it and everyone's taking pictures this and that and i'm like all right i got my picture i'm going to go back to cook dinner and uh so i go back and so I'm throwing the steaks on and i don't know if it's the same skunk or a cousin skunk or whatever but i had put a big uh rock on top of the metal garbage can lid and it comes over knocks it down like nothing's nothing's going on and starts eating through the trash again and i'm like what the hell so now i'm like you know we have to set some boundaries with the skunk and i so i get you know some of the extra it non-burning but fire logs and i i toss a piece at it and it bounces near it it's about 15 20 feet away from me and it just sits there and looks at me stops eating out of the garbage can and just looking at me and i'm like oh you want to go skunk you know and so i get like a huge piece of log and i like shot put chuck it and it like hits it in the shoulder and it's like just staring at me and sort of like making a little hissing growling sound and i'm like mari go inside shut the screen door in case it turns around to spray me right so i'm thinking as long as this doesn't turn his butt towards me i'm good so i'm sitting there so i'm like oh you want to play right apparently this doesn't skunk doesn't know i'm a marine right so i chuck another log and it hits it in the shoulder and now i'm just getting a little worried because this skunk has been hit with two pretty big pieces of firewood and it's just staring at me and i'm like but you know i know it'll like posture right because that's what you see in the movies and the bears you make noise and stuff like that so i start grabbing like metal utensils and clicking them together and screaming and stuff and finally it just sort of slinks off and goes to someone else's garbage can that's probably less work right so i'm like yeah that's right skunk you know don't don't mess with the marine and we have a lovely dinner after that so you know we go on some tours we see some black rhinoceroses which i guess <coughs> are endangered and you know we didn't see them during the day like they're like night predators maybe that's why they're called black rhinos i don't know and uh and so we're leaving and we're like well the only thing we didn't see was uh, a leopard and so we're like well that couple said you know they've been here for 21 years and they never saw one so we felt a little bit better 
And no shit, we're like a mile and a half from the exit um, of Kruger National Park. And I see this, by the way, I'm driving on the wrong side of the, the car on the wrong side of the road. Uh, and I see off to the distance, this movement. And, and I slam on the brakes with the dirt road and it's a leopard. And I'm like, holy shit, it's a fucking leopard. And so I'm like reversing on the wrong side of the road, but you know, so I'm basically reversing against the road because I'm on the right-hand side of the car. And I'm like, I'm rolling down the window of my little Ford Escort, South African style. I'm like, hand me the little sh camera. So I'm sitting there and the, the leopard is like 30 feet away. And uh, I got pictures, so I'm not making any of this stuff up. And it's just, and it's like just crouching. And I'm like, I fucking see you, right? And uh, it's like growling, snarling at us. And then all of a sudden, it, it starts charging our Ford Escort. And so there I am like trying to roll up the window, like that's going to do anything, right? And it like gets within like five feet of the car and like slides and is like snarling at us. And I'm like, well, I got to get a picture of this. So I have the little point and shoot and I roll down the window just so the camera lens isn't, you know, <laughs> blocked by the window. And I'm like snapping pictures and it's like wanting to attack the car, but I have the window roll. If the window was rolled down, we would both be dead. Um, so anyways, it starts like skirting off and I'm like reversing. And then uh, people are like coming behind me and they're trying to see what we're seeing. And like, everyone's like trying to take pictures of this leopard, leopard and anyways, it runs off. So we get some pictures. So we see the big five. So we leave Kruger and uh, oh, by the way, this is about two weeks before the World Cup was in South Africa. So things are starting to get a little hard to find rooms and stuff like that at this time. We really had no idea about uh, soccer um, world cup type stuff when we booked the trip. So anyways, we find this, we drive a couple hundred miles away. Beautiful. I mean, beautiful countryside. Every house has electrical electrified fence, uh, because it's not the safest country, but beautiful. And, uh, and so we find this, uh, little bed and breakfast and it has the coolest little bathroom design ever seen sort of walked in no doors you know just sort of walk through a maze type deal and so we're sitting there and we're eating breakfast in the morning trying to figure out what we're going to do and these girls like gorgeous girls in the middle of like the jungle are there and that's when i realized all the prostitutes for the world cup are starting to come in so we're eating you know uh sort of like an english breakfast bangers and mash and, and beans with these prostitutes and drinking some Nescafe instant coffee and stuff like that and sort of talking to them, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then I think my girlfriend started getting mad. I was talking to the prostitutes. So I'm like, all right, so I go back to the book and uh, there's a wild animal refuge that uh, is basically for like injured animals, sort of like the ones we volunteered for, um, 75 miles away or something. So we're like, let's go there. And it was actually a really neat tour. So basically it's like animals that got poached or trapped or shot or injured and can't like hunt for themselves. They stuck them in sort of like a, a rehabilitative zoo. So some of them get rehabilitated, go back to the wild. Most of them are too injured to like really survive in the wild. So they stay there. Um, so, you know, they have a, an avion bird uh, enclosure where you like, they give you a leather glove and some meat and a hawk comes in like, snags it out of your hand and stuff like that, which you don't really realize what talons mean until like you have a, you know, 20 pound hawk snagging something out of your hand. But anyways, we're going around and there's like a little baby rhinoceros running around. It's so cute until you realize it's still probably like 500 pounds and it's like head butting you and like trying to knock you over and stuff. So the cuteness wore off pretty quick when it was up close, but, uh, so we're going through and there's a lion enclosure and there's this uh, male and female lion and the male is just cut up. I mean, he has just scars and no fur and all over him look like scar from Lion King. And, uh, and so you're in there and once again, South Africa has no OSHA. So the lion enclosure is basically like nine foot tall chain link fence that you would see at like an elementary school. That's the, quality and strength of it. So the fence is all like mangled up and like some of them you could probably stick like a human head through. So the lions are like chewing and clawing on it. And uh, 
And there's like signs like don't stick your hands through the fence because they'll bite them off. And there's a, a, a dude like feeding it uh, one of the um, trainers or whatever you call it, feeding it meat, probably deer. And uh, it's like, you know, eating it. And then some dude like on the tour. Oh, so basically you got this torn up chain link fence and then another piece of chain link fence. So really if a lion wanted to eat a human, it could, it just would have to deal with another set of chain link fence. So it's just the nine of us on the tour would be food, but everyone in the park would have a little time. It's just a delay mechanism because it's not, you know, OSHA, it's a, like a kindergarten fence. So anyways, um, some dude's like, oh, the trainer's petting him and he tries to pet it and no shit, the lion like within like just millimeters misses from biting off like three of this dude's fingers. And the, the trainer is like all nonchalant. He's like, I told you not to, in some ass South Africa, I can't do it. Not to stick your hand through the fence or it would get bitten off. And the dude's like, probably urinated himself, you know, like, ah. and I'm like, dumbass. Right, so <clears throat> I asked, w w "Is this what's this lion like? Why is he all just scarred and cut up?" And he's like, "Oh, that's from and I don't remember the name, but that's from Babu, right? Babu is the name I'm making up right now because it sounds like an African pet." And uh, he's like, "That's from Babu, this uh, honey badger that's in the enclosure." Uh, and basically, so they had this honey badger. And it kept on escaping out of the enclosure and it would it, it like not off a tree it made a ladder and climbed out and then they would take the tree and it would get stuck. And so then it would take the tree and hide the tree, you know, limb and, uh, and then go off and it would go into like the, the trainer's houses and open their refrigerators and just like wreck havoc, go and kill a couple peacocks and stuff like that. Go attack this lion, fight the lion, a honey badger uh, and then like head back to its enclosure for its like second meal like it's a hobbit or something and they couldn't figure out why all these houses were destroyed and the lion kept on having to go to the vet and stuff like that and so they started like filming the lion enclosure and then they see this honey badger you know going digging underneath the fence and like attacking the, this lion fighting a lion and then you know coming back after the fight's over and so I'm like did the lion win? And he's like, well, the lions won like twice that the honey badgers had to go to the vet. And like about 10 times so far, the lions had to go to the vet and get stitched up and stuff. So I'm like, oh man, I, I need to see what this honey badger, you know, is all about. And then, so there's, you know, we're going around seeing all the different animals. And then we start getting to the honey badger pit. And uh, basically it's a pit cause they it kept on escaping. So they dig it deeper. And, uh, and they said they dug it deeper and raised the wall so it couldn't escape, then got a little depressed and wouldn't eat. So they got a female honey badger and stuck it in there. And immediately he just pushed her up to the wall because they thought it would be his mate. He just pushed her up to the wall and then climbed up her back and escaped out using her as a ladder. And, uh, and went and attacked the lion again. And so I'm like, oh, this honey badger sounds badass. And I look down in this pit and what do I see? the fucking African skunk. That is when I realized that I had almost died because here I am throwing firewood at what I think is just a large skunk, you know, because if it's black with a white stripe from head to tail, what would you think it is? A skunk, right? I mean, badgers are brown and they live up in like Montana or something. So I've got to wrap this up. Rum's almost out. So here I am thinking, oh, as long as uh, it doesn't turn around and spray me with its butt, right? Cause I'm still thinking it's a skunk. I'm okay. And I'm telling my girlfriend to just close the screen door and I messing with a honey badger. And now I've seen all the honey badger don't care things, but at the time, no idea. Uh, so I'm screwing with this throwing wood and hitting it, this honey badger that is going and attacking and winning against lions. And I, I have like a, uh, a pair of tongs in my hand, right? So uh, that's my African honey or honey badger story or my large African skunk story. Real quick, wrapping this up. I hope you enjoyed the story from one of my adventures. 
I meant, uh, made a mental note to tell you about the flight out of Johannesburg to uh, Paris. So here we are on the plane. It's Johannesburg city in South Africa to Paris and then Paris to like DC or something. And uh, they don't say anything like on the announcement. Um, and all of a sudden stewardesses on like both aisles just start popping these canisters and it's going down and it's just like fogging everybody. And they're just walking down and I'm thinking, holy crap, we're getting taken over by terrorists. You know, they're gonna, we're all gonna get knocked out or something. And they're just walking down with these foggers and they're wearing these like rebreathers, right? You know, like gas masks. And I'm like, oh, we're gonna get kidnapped or something. And I'm like, this is why I came. And so I'm thinking about how I'm gonna take out this like 100 pound stewardess walking around with the gas mask and this fogger canister when over the speaker comes like in five different languages, of course English is the last one, even though it's the language spoken in South Africa, they say it in like French and like Deutsch and Japanese or something. And finally in English is like, oh, because of the bug problem, we're spraying pesticides because France won't let us in without spraying. So no choice, no, heads up and and like this you're in a enclosed airplane like tube so it's not like you're getting fresh air right and they're just walking around with these like foggers you know and all i can picture is all these like tv shows and movies where people go and they get high when the tent and stuff like that and they're wearing gas masks and i don't have any i have like a napkin for like from my, like my peanuts right and uh so they're fogging so you know it turned out to be okay and I'm like, I'm glad I'm going back because <laughs> this has been quite the adventure. I almost died from throwing firewood at a honey badger, apparently, and uh, dug like hundreds of miles of fire breaks for this cult leader um, who's vegetarian and saved cat-sized monkeys. So that's my story. Didn't ride a motorcycle. Could have, uh, but didn't. And uh, hopefully, hopefully you like my uh, African story. Once again, this is Carlo. This is one of my uh, trip reports, I guess I'll categorize it under. And I'm out of rum, so you guys have a good day.